Hello. Today, I'm joined by James Thompson, Fund Manager of the Rathbone Global Opportunities Fund. The fund invests mainly in shares in developed markets. So James, to start off with, could you explain why the fund mainly sticks to developed markets and does not invest in the Asia-Pacific or emerging market regions? Yes, that's right. Um, well, the reason I stick to developed markets is because I don't think I have the skills or the expertise to credibly invest in, in emerging markets. I think it requires a lot of local knowledge when you're investing in Brazil, Russia, India, or China. Actually, early in my career, I spent quite a lot of time in emerging markets. And I think it really sort of reinforced my view that I'm not smart enough or, or I don't have enough experience to do it. So I really think if you want exposure to those parts of the world and that you should have some exposure, you should go to a dedicated emerging markets fund manager. You know, my fund sticks to developed markets where I think I have a reasonable track record of success over 18 years now. 65% uh, of the fund is in the US, 25% of the fund is in Europe, and the rest is in the UK. The fund looks for innovative and scalable businesses that are growing fast and shaking up their respective industries. So what are the key ingredients that you're looking for in a business to find a potential winner? Well, this is a growth fund. And when I started running money in 2003, um, I didn't like the idea of investing in businesses that were damaged or me too, um, unpredictable, highly reliant on variables outside of their control, and really their only quality being that the stocks look cheap. So I was always willing to pay a, a higher price for quality, uh, resilience, innovation, and scalability. And usually the only criticism that these businesses faced was that they'd already found success and so that all the good news was, was in the price. But usually I think what other investors underestimate is the potential size of the addressable market being larger than people expect. And often these companies uh, use their business as a platform to grow into adjacent areas. I think Amazon is a good example. I mean, Amazon started life selling books. And obviously, they achieved success doing that in a market capitalization that reflected that success. But of course, they used that as a springboard or a platform to go into different areas of e-commerce and then go to different areas of cloud computing and, 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 and different adjacencies after that, whether it's uh, online grocery, uh, healthcare, or actually, ironically, now moving into brick and mortar retail. So really, it's uh, trying to take advantage of where those markets are larger than investors uh, anticipate and where these businesses are using them as a platform. You aim to invest in companies before they become household names. In the top 10, there are a number of familiar names, including Alphabet, Amazon, and Microsoft. When did you first invest in each? And why do you still own all those three today? Yes, we've owned Microsoft and Alphabet for four or five years. Uh, we've owned Amazon for more than 10 years. But I think even 10 years ago, Amazon was a household name. But investors, and particularly professional fund managers, hated it. I hated it for the heavy investments that depressed profitability. Hated it because they didn't follow the Wall Street cookie cutter of holding our hands and spoon feeding us with the future strategy with precision. You know, I, I really think the growth potential for all of these businesses was underestimated and the addressable market was a lot larger than people thought. So we still own these businesses. Uh, I think they are you know, mission critical, gold standard growth companies. And if you just look at Microsoft, you know, this is now an indelible part of our corporate and personal IT. Uh, and yet IT spending for most businesses still represents less than 3% of revenues. You know, the, the digital transformation that all of our companies are going through is very real. And it ends up becoming a, an arms race uh, where you are constantly trying to be at the leading edge for your, your, your employees and your customers. And that will benefit uh, businesses like Microsoft, Alphabet, and Amazon, I think, for many years. 
Could you run through a couple of stock examples of companies that are not at the moment household names, but in a couple of years' time have the potential to be? Well, that's an interesting question. Actually, uh, at Rathbones every year, we have a Christmas quiz. And we're asked to pick the, the single stock we think will be the best performer over the next year. In 20 years, I haven't won that competition once, which is um, pretty embarrassing. But I think what it shows you is actually picking single stocks is hard. But building a portfolio gives you so many more shots on goal. So with, with the risk of being wrong in the short term, um, I'll, I'll give you a few potential uh, companies that uh, could become household names. I think the first one is, is Fevertree. Fevertree is a business that is a household name in the UK, but not in the US. And that's the market that they're tackling now. And I think it could be in a few years, but I don't think it will be with a, a tonic strategy. Americans don't drink nearly as much gin as they should. And so I think if Fever Tree is successful uh, in the US market, it will come on the back of uh, drinks like ginger ale, ginger beer, pink grapefruit, and flavored sodas. I think that potentially is the success uh, factor for Fever Tree in the United States. Another business, Essilor Luxottica. Uh, Luxottica has made almost every pair of sunglasses you, you ever owned. Ray-Bans, Oakley's, Armani, Prada, Versace, Dolce & Gabbana, all under the brand of these uh, luxury goods companies, but all produced and designed by Luxottica. Essilor is the largest lenses company in the world, and the combination is obvious, uh, but I think compelling. You know, we're in a world of a rapidly aging population who spend a lot of time uh, staring at screens. And so I think there's probably a pandemic of poor vision brewing uh, that needs to be addressed. And I think this is uh, an exciting business. It's a great combination of, of vanity and vision. And then the final business is a U.S. business called CoStar. And this is certainly not a household name. But is it, a, it is a U.S. property giant. Uh, but they don't own any property. They own data. And data on almost every commercial property in the developed world. It's the Bloomberg of commercial property data, except the difference is that there's no alternative. There is no Reuters, there's no fact set, there's no Refinitiv. Uh, it, there's one golden source of data uh, that every customer needs. And they also have a residential business uh, that looks a lot, a lot like a baby right move. So I think the, you know, the growth, the resilience, and the domination of these businesses has been underclubbed by the market. And so they potentially could become uh, very successful in the future. A part of the portfolio is invested in recession resistant shares. Could you run through a couple of examples? And what is the current allocation to that part of the portfolio at the moment? We allocate anywhere between 15 and 25% of the fund in what I call these sort of weatherproof recession resistant businesses. And that actually was a direct reaction to the dreadful performance that I had in 2008. And I came out of that year and I said, you know, I have to get better as a fund manager. I need uh, more balance and diversity in this fund to protect against these uh, dislocations. But at the moment we have about 20% of the fund in this uh, uh, weatherproof uh, bucket, this defensive part of the portfolio. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is a, a company that collects garbage. Uh, waste Connections, a U.S. business. In the U.S., you actually pay for your garbage collection, uh, and things have to get pretty bad for you to turn off that service. And, uh, you know, even if you're consuming less in a recession, which is not really in the American ethos, but, uh, you know, whether your bin is full or your bin is three-quarters full, uh, sadly, you pay the same. And actually for this business in, in many markets, they're granted monopolies or de facto monopolies as these garbage companies actually own the landfill sites. So I think that's a good sort of defensive business to, to own in the portfolio. And it, it doesn't tend to do well in a booming economy, um, but provides us with a buffer during more difficult times. And then another uh, US business I'd, I'd point to is Costco, uh, which is the wholesale members club. 
Now, of course, this is a, a retail business, and at first blush, you'd think that might be vulnerable during periods of, of, of economic dislocation. But actually, I think it's highly recession resistant by virtue of its low prices and staple-like items that they sell. It's actually the only retailer in the world I've ever heard of that has a ceiling on their markup. Uh, normally, retailers try and achieve as much markup as possible. Uh, but uh, reportedly, Costco has a 15% uh, uh, markup limit. And then when you combine that with the scale and the buying power that Costco has, it means that even in an inflationary environment where we are now, I think their value and quality will become even more compelling. James, thank you very much for your time today. Great pleasure, Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> 